It's another great day for a lecture on data science. Thanks for joining us today for everybody who's there remotely and those who are here with us in person. The topic of this month's lecture in the Dawn of the Data Age lecture series is about interpreting data like a pro. So a few of the past lectures have built towards this. We've covered some of this material in the July lecture, but most of this is new and all of it focuses on the core skills that you need to develop individually to start to be able to look at data, interpret it correctly, and then next month, turn that into actionable insights. My name is Luciano Pesci. I'm the founder and CEO, co-founder I should say, and CEO of Imperitas. We are a services as a subscription team of economists and data scientists delivering bi-weekly customer lifetime value intelligence so that our clients can beat their competitors for the most profitable customers. I'm also the founder and director of the Utah Community Research Group at the University of Utah, where I teach a lot of classes related to economics and data. And I teach as an adjunct at Westminster, and I developed their three-class MBA emphasis in data science. So a lot of what I'm going to cover today comes out of both of those backgrounds. There's three goals for the lecture, and it's broken into these sections. And then at the end, there's a, a, a case study example, a worked example. We're going to go through data, look at the data set, and interpret variable by variable. But before we do that, I need to give you the foundation on which you know how to start to look at data sets for their differences. And that's really the first part, is how do you identify different data types and their context? The second piece is how to explain uh, to you the right way of selecting analytical methods. This is a direct byproduct of the data type you have and the context of the data you will be limited in your options as far as what analytical methods you can bring to bear. And then the third in the big component of what this lecture is for is to show you those core data interpretation skills. And like anything, this is the kind of thing that can feel very daunting at first. There's a lot about data that can make you confused when you first look at it and how to figure out what type it is and its context. The best way to do this is re just repetition is to just continually look at data and ask the same questions over and over, which is what we're going to go through with the case study. Again, if you have questions as I'm going along, the chat window is open. Some of you have already been using it. Feel free to unmute yourself, jump in and ask a question at any time. I prefer to have questions as we go rather than just wait till the end. But you can put them either in the chat window or ask them verbally. So data types and context, this is a step that a lot of people overlook. They get eager to start their data analytics and they just jump right in. They run some, they run some descriptives, they do some correlations, and they try to make sense of what's going on. And they're lacking the context, the background, the understanding of what the data is, where it came from, and all these distinctions that, like I said, will limit your analytical options and will limit your interpretation. There are many, many ways to define data. Four that are critical that you should always be asking yourself. The first time anyone hands you a data set, these four things should be coming to mind. One, how was it created? What's the origin of this data? Two, is this a sample or is this the total data set, meaning it's a census? Three, what is the scope? Was this captured once in time or was it captured repeatedly over time? And then four, how has this been quantified, the data that's within this? I'm going to go through each of these now in detail, but as a first step, when someone hands you a data set, just ask yourself, what's the origin, totality, scope, and measurement? Origin is, is uh, probably the second most important after measurement. Measurement determines so much of the an uh, analytics that you can do, but origin, if you don't understand where this data came from, you're going to be pretty limited in your effectiveness in interpreting it. And origin comes down to really three places. You can really only get data from three different sources. You can create experiments, and these can be very detailed. A lot of economists, behavioral economists, will do this where they come into an organization, they set up these experiments, they monitor, track, watch people. Uh, a famous example of this was how to stop break room theft people who are stealing things from the fridge that's not theirs, 
And one of the things they did is they put up different kinds of posters, and what they realized was that posters that had eyes on them detracted or dissuaded people from, from stealing. That was a very carefully constructed experiment. Posters had to be set up at specific times in specific ways so that you can control for things. So this is a costly but potentially powerful way of getting data. And it's really, if you want causal understanding, it really can't be beat. The second, and to the, becoming more and more popular, is surveys. Pro platforms like Qualtrics make this really easy now. And so there's been this explosion of survey data within organizations. And I think that's because it's very easy to get now. It used to be with surveys, you had to go out and do them by phone, on paper. You might intercept somebody at a mall and talk to them. They weren't very quick and easy until the rise of the internet and platforms like Qualtrics that now make it mobile friendly and pretty painless to collect survey data. The shortcoming is that this is attitudinal or intent data. It doesn't actually show you what is happening or what will happen. It's people's opinions on what they would do. And then the third is observational data. This is now becoming the most common and it's because of the quantification of everything with the digital transformation. Machines mostly capture this. When you log into Facebook, there is a server on the Facebook campus that puts into a data column this person logged in at this time, just timestamps it. It does it every single time. And that's how organizations like Facebook have been able to go into the data and figure out that on average, their users log in, last I saw it was 40 times, 60 times a day for some people. That data is really great because it's what actually happened. As long as it's been set up correctly and the machines are running correctly, it shows actual outcomes instead of intent. But it's very rigid. Whatever you're setting up to collect, that's it. And there's no more. So when it comes to origin, just ask yourself, which of these three places did it come from? Was it an experiment? It's very unlikely that that'll be the case. More than likely, it will be either survey or observation. The next of those four questions is about the totality. Do you have data for every possible unit in a population of interest? And when I say population, this could be people. So you could say, all of our customers. Well, is that current customers? Does that include past customers? That is, does that include future possible customers? Because that then becomes the population. You're never going to talk to all future possible customers because you don't know how to identify them. You're probably not going to be able to reach all past customers because some of them might not have had a good experience and don't want to talk to you ever again. Or they may have changed information. You can't reach them. It is very rare to deal with census data. It has the benefit of Whatever you run descriptively on it, there's no inference necessary. That's just the out, that is what you're looking at. That's the average, that's the max, that's the min. But outside of the government, very few people have the power to collect census data. In most cases, you'll be using a sample. This is also true if you're doing any sort of destructive testing. If you are a device manufacturer, you don't want to destroy every single device to make sure that you're, to get the population average of its uh, tolerances. Instead, you take randomized samples and you use those to infer through inferential probability and statistics the larger unknowable population. And if the sampling is done correctly, and that's what this visual is trying to show, is that in the population you have these different things. You have red dots, blue dots, green dots, brown dots. If your sample was just all blue dots, it wouldn't be representative. It's probably not going to be very predictive. If instead you get a good mix of uh, the population, a good cross-section, it's representative, then your inference will have a high probability of being correct. But there's no guarantee. And that's the limitation of a sample. What about the time dimension? This one changes the analytical approaches that you can do pretty significantly. Uh, most data, just like it being sample, most data is going to be cross-sectional. You took it once at time. Uh, you took it all at one time. Or it may have been measured over time, but you're summing it up and you're looking at it uh, in a context that doesn't require that you're, that you're taking into consideration the time dimension. So you could have ticket sales, and you could look at those ticket sales by month, and that would be time series data because it's the same thing measured over time, ticket sales. You could also at one time sum up all ticket sales to date, and now that data, same data, is cross-sectional. 
And when you move into the world of predictive modeling, which is not the purpose of today, we're going to end there and talk a little bit about it, but when you move into the world of predictive modeling, time series data takes a totally different set of tools than cross-sectional analysis. But I said measurement was the most important, and that's because everything that you want to do analytically and your interpretation will depend on what kind of data you have. And there are four basic types, and they build on each other, and that's what this visual shows. If you notice the arrows, nominal can, be, can grow. You add something to nominal data, and you get ordinal data. You add something to ordinal data, and you get interval data. You add something to ratio data, or to interval data, and you get ratio data. You can also always take something like ratio data and dumb it down to interval, ordinal, or nominal data. But you can't do that with nominal data to ratio data. And that's because of the things it possesses. So nominal data can just be counted. It's strictly categorical. There's no order to it. So um, gender is a good example of this. There's categories and groups. Uh, that is different in the fact that it can only be counted from something like education level, which actually is measured in years over time. But it's still, you know, you could look at each year as its own category. Nominal data is the most common. You can make nominal data out of anything. In fact, if you create binary variables, this is a good way to, to get nominal data. It's very good for quick counting, but all you can do with it is just describe. Now, if the ordering of that matters, so we go back to education, if we, instead of grouping education by years of education, we say high school, trade school, associate, associate's degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, uh, postdoc, or JD, PhD, postdoctoral, now we've created categories that aren't the same number of years. An associate degree does not take the same amount of time as high school. A master's degree does not take the same amount of time as a PhD. And, but... The order of those things does matter. You do high school before you do something like trade school or an associate's degree. You do those before you usually do something like a bachelor's degree. Most graduate programs will not let you in unless you have a bachelor's degree. So now there's an order that matters to that data, even other categories, and that's ordinal data. From ordinal data to interval data, you make this big jump. You move from the world of categorical data, where you're really only counting and doing some basic visualization, bar charts mostly, or pie charts. And you move into continuous data, where now the full scope of parametric statistics is available to you. You can do things like means, and standard deviation, and variance, and things that are a little bit more precise, and that's because now the distance between those ordered units, is, or those ordered categories, is a consistent unit size. So Likert scale or survey data, net promoter score data, things that ask you, hey, on a scale of one to five, uh, how likely are you to do this? Or what's your satisfaction level? A one to a two to a three to a four to a five has the same unit, an integer unit in this case, between them. And so for that reason, the order doesn't just matter, but now the distance between them matters. And that's interval data. And then the ultimate form, the highest form of data that you can get, is ratio data. And this is where there's now a logical zero point. So with satisfaction, if it's on a scale of 1 to 5, and, there is, and you're saying 1 is extremely unsatisfied and 5 is extremely satisfied, there's no real clear zero point to that. Not like there would be with age, right? You weren't born, you don't have negative age available to you. Or income, you can't make negative income. And so because of that, now you have a logical zero point, which means you can make ratios out of any of these variables, which is important. And this is the highest form of data that you can get your hands on. So if you have ratio data, and this, this is really important for when you decide to go collect something like on a survey, you could decide to collect age as ratio. You could say, text it, fill in this box. What is your age, number of years? You could do it ordinally. You could create categories and say, are you under 35? Are you 36 to 44? Are you 45 to 54? Now you have ordinal groups. So you can decide that with some things, and you should know that ahead of time because it will limit what analysis you can bring to bear and what you can do as far as interp interpretation. Now, as one more note, because we're going to see this in the data when we launch it, the... Uh, there's a very special kind, two special kinds of nominal variables. 
One that has become increasingly important is unstructured data. This unstructured data can come from a whole bunch of places. It can come from machines. It can come from survey responses that are, hey, just tell me what you think, and you leave an open-ended box that they can fill in. Every one of those responses is unique, so really all you can do is count them or maybe count up some words in them, but it's nominal data. The other type of nominal data you should be always on the lookout for are unique identifiers, and this is a one-for-one -one nominal relationship. So your social security number is an example of a nominal identifier. Your social security number is one-for-one -one associated with you, and someone else does not have that. So there's never gonna be some overlap. So if you take something like, if you decide to count the number of observations in a column of data that's nominal, and it's a nominal identifier, all you're gonna get is a unique count because every single one will be unique. And sometimes that's what you need to do to get an N value to understand the size of the data you're dealing with, but usually nominal identifiers are there to keep the relationships consistent between the rows, which are the things you've observed about, and then the columns, which are the measurements of the, that observation, the row, which is usually a person or a uh, computer or machine or a country or it's a specific thing and everything about it on that entire row across all columns is is associated with that unique identifier. So they're important but you really you don't want to take the average value of social security numbers. It doesn't make any sense. Even though social security numbers incrementally have been increased in number over time and do have a geographical coding in them, you can't get that out by running the average of them or the median of them, it just doesn't make any sense. So those four things, okay, origin, totality, scope, and measurement are the foundation. As soon as you have a data set, you should start there. And measurement is where you will initially have a really hard time doing this, but then over time, the more you do it, you'll just look at a data and data point and immediately know, oh, that's nominal, that's interval, that's ratio. But it's important because you can't select what type of analysis you're going to do without knowing, is it in that categorical half or is it in that continuous half of the measurement, uh, the measurement distribution? Categorical data, nominal and ordinal, you're really talking about counts. There's not a lot of, of uh, analysis that you can do on those. There's some ordinal analysis, but really most of it that you're going to want to do things. People want to see like averages and medians and mins and maxes and things. Uh, nominal is not going to have that at all. Ordinal will have some of it, but some of it will also be nonsensical. So the median of an ordinal variable in which the categories are just, uh, you know, like education, for example, it could give you a rough idea of where overall education is, but measuring it in years and then getting a continuous variable instead that you could run an actual average on would be more useful. Another piece that will determine this is time series versus cross-sectional. So even if you have categorical or continuous, you can have a cross-sectional categorical variable. You can have a time series categorical variable. But again, that's another one of those distinctions that will change your analytics approach, mostly when it comes to predictive modeling, although a little bit with visualization as well. Almost all analytical methods can be grouped into two approaches. The first is looking for differences. You go into this data, you compare means or medians, you try to find unique subgroups. How do things differ? How does something like customer lifetime value change based on something like gender or based on donor status? Are they a donor to the organization on top of buying things like tickets? Or are they have they been a member of our of our bank or credit union for years, for many, many years, versus someone who's brand new. How do those groups differ? You're looking for specific types of differences. And this is where categorical data is really useful. So if you have something continuous, like say, customer lifetime value that's been measured in dollars and has a distinct zero point and is ratio data, then you can look at that and break it apart by something like gender or member status, which is gonna be binary, or categorical and see what is the average value of this person this this categorical type 
for customer lifetime value versus this other categorical type for customer lifetime value. So categorical data is very useful in breaking apart continuous data. The other is measures of association, like correlation. Um, they're a good way to find patterns within the data that now move together. So do ticket sales go up when customer lifetime value goes up? Probably. Um, does customer lifetime value go up when satisfaction goes up? Probably. Does customer lifetime value go up when they are likely to recommend? Maybe, maybe not. They might just not want to recommend, and so it has no effect. Correlation, you'll hear this all the time. People say correlation does not equal causation. That is absolutely true. However, this is where theory comes in. So here's a good example. There's a great website, if you've never seen it, called Spurious Correlation. This guy, Tyler Viggen, hope I'm saying his last name, Viggen or Vision, has done a really humorous job of plotting two different things over time. So this is time series data that you're looking at here. And showing that they can move together and arguably from a theory standpoint, they have no connection. So here's the example. There's two plots here that are measured from 1999 to 2009. So this is a 10 year time horizon. This is time series data. And it's the same thing being measured for these two plots over time. In one case, it's the number of Nicolas Cage movies that are released that year. In the other case, it's the number of people who drown in that year. These two things move really, really well together. 66.6% .6 correlation is extremely high. Most of the time after 70% correlation, people just say, now we're into causation. These are so correlated that there's got to be a causal connection that we, we need to understand between them. Well, here's an example to show you that just because there's high correlation, that does not mean that they're connected. I don't know how you make a theoretical argument for people drowning in pools based on Nicolas Cage movies unless they're walking into the pools after watching the movies. So whether you're going to go down the route of a test of a difference or a, a test of association, and you know whether it's cross-sectional or time series, you know whether you have a sample or a census, you know um, if uh, it's nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio, each variable that you're dealing with, when you sit down the core interpretation skills that you should be able to have, and this is where we're going to spend the majority of, of the rest of this webinar, is going through examples and talking through them. You don't want to have to keep answering those questions one at a time. You do want to develop that in intuition, and you can over quick, quick, even a few months, if you're really digging into data and testing yourself on this, within a few months, you should be able to just sit down, look at the data, and get 95% of what you need to know just by looking at it. Okay. Well, how do you look at it? What's the best way to start to look at data? There are tables. We'll talk about the five number summary. We'll talk about things like the minimum value, the maximum value, the quartile ranges, uh, medians, means, n size, the counts of how many observations you have. That's important information, and it's, it is very uh, efficiently displayed in a table. And I would say that 99% of people who are doing anything that they call analytics, and I want to make a distinction between interpreting data and analytics. Uh, interpreting data is usually on a single variable basis. You're looking at one variable, maybe two, and looking at patterns. That's very different than analytics that will say, okay, I've looked at patterns in this variable, I've looked at patterns in this variable, I've looked at patterns in another variable, now I'm gonna to start to understand the connections between all of them, and it's sort of the next step towards predictive modeling. Whether you're gonna end up doing predictive modeling or not, you're still gonna start with this, basic, descriptive, exploratory analysis. And tables lie a lot, I'll show you. They lie because you have too high or too low of an average value, because you have outliers. Or they lie because you have multimodality. One of the examples I gave in another, the July lecture. Right, let's talk about uh, net promoter score. It can be measured on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 is extremely unlikely to recommend and 10 is extremely likely to recommend. If you get an average value of 5, and you look at your table and you say, great, the min is 0, the max is 10, the average is 5. Those all are consistent with the way the survey question that we collected this data, the cross-sectional survey data for which is we have a sample, 
that's all consistent with it. Our average experience must be five. Well, let's assume that there were only two people who took the survey. And one person said that they had a zero experience and one person said that they had a 10 experience. That average is five. That average does not tell you anything about either of those people's experience. That's called multimodality. And that's a real problem in data I'm gonna show you. So if you only ever go the table route, you are not likely to get the correct answer. Similarly, if you only look at a distribution, you're gonna miss some stuff. So tables and visualizations together and that's each slide is going to have both of them on there where it's appropriate, are the best way to go. Sometimes those tables are just the end size. So with nominal data, what's the end count? Maybe there's five categories. What are the counts of each of those categories? What are the percentages of those categories? But they're all categorical, so it doesn't matter how we show them. There's no ordinal nature to them. So that visualization will be very basic compared to something like a scatter plot of two continuous variables. So tables and visualizations, once you understand all the background stuff that we've talked about, that foundation stuff, and you sit down and start doing the work, think about using tables and visualizations, and you're after these three things. Because these three things will come out of both the tables and the visualization. The shape of the distribution. There are numeric values that you can get in tables to tell you things like skew or fatness of tails. None of them, none of them are as telling for anyone as an actual visualization. If you want to understand the shape of the distribution, you need a visualization. It will help you also understand the shape, uh, the center and the spread, but the center and the spread are values that can come out of tables very efficiently. But this is not an either or. You use both methods so you can answer these three things. Shape, center, spread. So let's go through each in detail and then we'll jump into the examples the example data set. So the shape of an ordinal, first off, the shape of a nominal variable doesn't really matter because you could move categories around, there's no ordinal nature to it, and it doesn't matter. It could be five choices, what are your five favorite movies? And you could have a hundred things listed and all you're looking at are the five movies, the top five that people preferred. It doesn't matter if you show one versus the other in whatever order. So there's no distributional shape like you're seeing here on the left side that it skews to the left or it skews to the right or it's symmetric. You could artificially create that with a nominal variable. That's why you don't do this with nominal variables. But with ordinal variables, now there is a distributional shape because the order of those bars does matter. So if we, you know, like, let's assume, uh, let's look at the symmetric one here in the bottom. Let's assume that that's a distribution of education levels. Whatever's on the left should be the lowest education level possible. Whatever's on the right should be the highest education level that's possible. That order matters. It's very true of interval and very true of ratio as well that order matters. It has to be displayed correctly. And a visualization is a fast way to start to see these patterns versus a table. With central value, uh, for interval and ratio data, continuous data, this will tell you what to predictively expect. So you have the median, the mean, and the mode. And in a normal distribution, the bell curve that people are all familiar with, if it is truly normally distributed, then the mean, the median, and the mode are all the same thing. The mode is the most frequently occurring value. The mean is the geometric average. It's where if you put it on an actual scale, at the average value, it would perfectly balance on the scale. The median is you order them from lowest to highest or highest to lowest, it doesn't matter, but you order all the observations and then you go find the middle most numerically. So if there's a hundred, you go to the, uh, the 49th and 50th. I think when it's an even number, you have to take the average of the two centermost values. If it had been 101, then I think the average is 51, you get 50 below, 50 above. Those are different ways of looking at measures of center, but all of them are about, well, what's the most common thing to expect? If someone walks in who's nine feet tall, you're going to be extremely startled by that person because you have become conditioned to expect a certain range over which most humans grow to a certain height. 
anything below that average, anything above that average, you will notice if it's extreme enough. And that's where skew comes in. This is outliers. So measures of center, the, after you get the shape, the next thing you want to look at are measures of center because this is predictability. Now that predictability can be very imprecise based on the variance. So if you have a low variance distribution, the spread of that data is narrow. Right, so you'll see this when we get to uh, one of the example data points here with net promoter score, or actually with the uh, likelihood to recommend version of that. Um, the variance is, you know, st it stretches from 0 to 10. There are people who said 0, there are people who said 10, but the majority of the data is around 9 and 10. So that variance is tighter, smaller than some other distributions that might have lots of data spread out on different tails or across the long, I'll show you some that have huge variance. If you want to understand the 50, the central 50% of that data, the interquartile range, which you can get from the five number summary, which I'll show you in a moment, it's pretty simple. You just subtract the first quartile, the 25%, from the third quartile, the 75%, and that gives you the middle 50%. Now, variance is just the square root of the standard deviation, so uh, it doesn't matter which you do. Most people just show variance, um, but it's just a measure of how spread out the data is. So we're back to measures of shape, measures of center, measures of spread. A lot of this can be summarized in the five number summary and in a box plot, box and whisker plot, which is what this is called. So you can see that interquartile range, the 50% of the data that's between the third quartile and the first quartile. You can see where the median is. You can also see that that median is uh, closer to the first quartile than the third quartile. But that's the central 50% of the data. Then you've got minimums and maximums. Those are supposed to go out to 1.5 times the interquartile range. Um, when they get the fence, any values outside of those will be considered... Uh, outliers, and we'll talk about outliers quite a bit here in a bit, um, but minimum values, quartiles, median mean, and max value is a standard request from any statistical package. Just give me the five number summary. This is the best table to run. The only thing that's missing from it usually is the end count. How many observations do you have, which you want to know, because if you're going to report things in percentage, then people need to convert it back. Well, okay, what's 40%? Is it four people or is it 400 people? You don't know that from the percentage values unless you have an end count. So sometimes you need to add that on if you don't get it from the five number summary. The other thing that this, this kind of table and visual is very useful for is figuring out if there are inconsistencies in the way something was measured. So if you have a survey and you know that you've scaled satisfaction from one to five and you get a min value of zero, that might be because you're missing data and it just marked it as zero instead of marking it as missing as null. And if that's the case, then you need to fix that because the minimum value on that survey question, survey question couldn't be zero. It could only be one. So lots of information concisely expressed in a very quick and easy to calculate set of numbers. Okay, I said the only way to really grasp this is to apply it over and over and over again. And we're gonna walk through, the rest of this is just walking through examples, um, all related to customer lifetime value that deal with different kinds of data. So we'll go through what's the origin story then we'll go through individual, we'll look at the data set, then we'll look at individual variables, we'll visualize them, we'll plot them, we'll do five number summaries, and I'll, and I'll talk about, okay, if you have this output, now how do you start to interpret it? Because everything that I've shown you so far in the first, we're already 35 minutes into this, uh, everything that I've shown you so far has been strictly about the foundation that you need to appropriately infer from these outputs because if someone brings you the average value of a social security variable you should know immediately oh that's nominal identifier data you can't do that that median value that mean value means nothing 
So here's the data set that we're going to look at. And uh, if you would like this data set, right now you can volunteer in the chat window, and I will make sure that you get a copy of it afterwards. Or you can send me my, uh, an email, or you can get a hold of me through Imperitas, Luciano at Imperitas.com, and I will send you this data set. It has been redacted and de-identified and normalized. So it is not the entire data set, but this is real data that came from a survey of festival goers, which will be referred to as customers for this festival for the remainder of this. It is, like I said, that's from a survey. That survey had a hundred-ish questions, a little bit more than that. It might have been almost 200, 150 plus we made additional variables from some variables. It had 3,834 fully completed surveys. It answered every question that we'd asked. There were different flows through the survey, so some people answered five questions, some people answered 60 questions, but overall there were 3,834 completed surveys. This equates to in total almost a million data points. So the first thing you have to do is sit down and say, why am I going to look through a million data points? What am I looking for? I've simplified that process a little by removing anything that was uniquely identifiable, any names, emails, and you're just getting the data set that has uh, different, different types of data that we can use to explain what well, are the nominal ordinal interval ratio, but all of this is cross-sectional. The vast majority of the data came from the survey, with one exception. We used emails to link actual observed lifetime ticket sales to their individual surveys. So here's how that was done. Ticket sales over time is time series, but cumulative ticket sales today is a single metric. And so that's why this is all cross-sectional, and the majority of it is self-reported, but that one variable is not. The actual customer lifetime value variable, which is the summation of lifetime ticket sales, is observational. It was captured by a ticketing system, and if they use that email, then we got the value. Now, some some background origin on this data. It was possible for someone to have multiple email accounts. And we did not, there was not the ability to find out who those people were uh, unless there was clear duplication by things like IP address, name and, e and phone number and other things that they gave us, which didn't happen a lot. But another common thing was, well, I might buy tickets this show. The next time for the festival, my, my wife might buy the tickets. And so our household is in there in two rows, but they are two unique individuals and that customer lifetime value might be missing the fact that together we're sort of this one collective customer. That is a weakness of this data that you should be aware of. But in 3,834 surveys, meaning we have 3,834 3, individuals who have given us all this information and we know their ticket sales data, um, it's not likely that we have a lot of bias coming in from that kind of an issue. When you're handed a data set, go look at it. Don't just start running analysis. Don't just start doing descriptives. Open it. Look at the rows and look at the columns. So I'm going to jump to this. It takes There's a lag, so I'll give it a second. If you can't see this, post something now in the comments. All right, people can see it. So column A is, well, let's do a little, uh, let's do a little quick poll. What kind of data is column A? Someone throw it up in the chat. I wish I had the Jeopardy music right now. Kind of looks like it's interval, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, Kathy's hit it though. Isn't it an auto incremented field? It is. And at the top, it has a column header that tells you what this is. Notice that when I highlight this column, if you look down in the bottom right, there are 3,835 counts. If you strip out the one header of all the titles of these columns, then you're to the 3,834. This is an auto-incremented field, and it is a unique nominal identifier. Its only purpose is to just keep track of this person's customer lifetime value and the fact that they've been coming for six to nine years and the fact that they typically buy eight tickets per visit 
and the fact that they're highly likely to recommend. So if I was to take this and color it, and then I go through, let me actually do this. And then I was to sort this data for some reason. Maybe I want to look at overall satisfaction from highest to lowest, and I sort this data. If this yellow bar suddenly breaks, and some of it's on one row and some of it's on another row, I've lost the one-for-one one connection between this individual, who is ID number six, and their observations, their measurements of these variables. That's all this column is there to ensure. A unique identifier. Running the average of this makes no sense. Visualizing this makes no sense. It's there for an important reason. I don't need to deal with it. What about this customer lifetime value? Let's throw it up in the chat again. Well, let's start here. Is it survey or observation? Is it time series or cross-sectional? And then is it nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio? Right. It is observational. It came from a computer. Ticket sales have been aggregated by the machine over time. We're taking the cumulative of it, the lifetime value as of now, so it is cross-sectional and this is ratio data it's measured in dollars there's a clear zero you can see there are some people with a zero customer lifetime value that's amazing for someone who's been coming 10 to 14 years or 15 to 19 years unless this was your uh, spouse's email account and your spouse typically buys the tickets which is actually something we have controlled for in the survey but it's not one of the columns that I've included here years attended is ordinal those are categories. Those are the categorical choices that they were given. Don't remember one year, two to five years, six to nine years, 10 to 14 years, 15 to 19 years, or more than 20 years. So the units within those categories are not consistently spaced. This is strictly ordinal data. Number of tickets per visit. This is uh, also ratio. Likelihood to recommend, likelihood to return, and overall satisfaction. These are all uh, these are all interval. There's no zero point on them. Even likelihood to re recommend, it has a zero in here, but that's not because you don't have any likelihood to recommend. It's you're extremely unlikely. That's the grouping of it. And then there are other activities that they do while at the festival. These are uh, all listed out in binary form. These are all nominal. Right, it's either 0 or 1. If it's 0, they didn't do it. If it's 1, they did. You can take the average of this column, even though it is uh, categorical. Because it's binary and it's coded as 0, 1, the ratio of the difference will actually show you the proportions. It's just a quick step, like a trick, to get to a number faster than doing some transformations. But it is nominal data. There were other data columns. Are they a donor or not to this festival? Um, things that might have been useful for customer lifetime value, but we had to create a succinct and usable data set. We can look around. It looks pretty consistent. Not seeing anything that jumps out at me as far as you know breaks in the line. And sometimes you bring in data, this line will suddenly change. So all of a sudden, this value will show up here, and this value will show up here. That's the kind of stuff you want to look for. But overall, this looks like pretty consistent data. Can already tell just scrolling through it that very few people do not remember how many years they've been attending. There's no way, unless I guess you're that Rain Man guy from the 80s, there's no way that you're going to scroll through this and figure out what the average customer lifetime value is, figure out what the average uh, net promoter score or likelihood to receive return or satisfaction levels are or the counts of activities which activities are the most popular there's no way that you're going to just scroll through this and know all the patterns that are actually in here that's the whole purpose of the of the descriptives that we're going to do so spend some time looking at the data set make sure you have clear 
headers on the columns and you know what this column represents and you know that what this column's connection to this row is this a person is this a group is this uh a organization is this a state is this a nation in this case these are individual customers fair goers festival goers i'm sorry so we know our rows we know our columns we know that this is mostly survey data from here over is all survey data this was an auto incremented variable we created and this was an observational data we got from a computer system and we matched it by email it's cross-sectional it is definitely a sample uh, 3834 is not the full size of this customer base and if we were still in doubt about any of this data, we should ask for either a data map or a data dictionary. In this case, because it came from a survey, getting a PDF of the survey itself with the coded values on the choice options would be sufficient for you to figure this all out. All right, let's start. What are the things that affect customer lifetime value? Our end goal is to understand customer lifetime value. That's why we cut the data down to those columns. Let's start with attendance patterns. How many years have these customers, these uh, festival goers, been attending? 68% of them. These first three categories, right? This is ordinal data, so this matters. The, this one kind of throws it like, you could have put this on this end, it didn't matter. But this is clearly ordinal. One year is a lower value than two to three years, which are two to five years, which is a lower value than six to nine years. And so ordering them in this way matters. It also shows us a distribution that matters. Had these just been the, the 10 activities that they do, we could have sorted them in any way we wanted. Probably we should sort them from highest to lowest because that would show this is the activity everybody does. But this is ordinal data. This needs to be to the left of this. This needs to be to the left of this. And what we see quickly is there's this kind of normally distributed pattern here, and you can even see it kind of taper. And then suddenly it spikes. And that's because there are two very different groups of customers within this data. And I can say that because I've spent so much time mining this data set that I know from other variables that there are reasons for this distinction. This is called multimodality. It's not particularly pronounced. I'll show you a much more pronounced example of multimodality in a minute. But there's something different about this group. And it turns out to be really important. But immediately, if you see something like this, hey, it kind of normally distributes around here and then it's picking up again. Why? Is it just because 20 year plus has been grouped, so really this would just continue to fall forever? Or is it because there are two groups, those who've been kind of engaged for the last 10 years and those who have been coming for a very long time? And it turns out that that's actually the correct interpretation. You won't get that from just this variable, but you start to see there might be something here about a different group and how we could investigate them. Okay, ordinal data, this is about as far as you can go. Counts, we could have converted this into percentages. I left it as raw counts, so you could convert it to percentages if you want. It wouldn't change the distributional shape. This is still two to five years is the, is the biggest single group. I think this is 30 something percent. Someone can do the math, 1386 divided by 3,834. If you're going to try to predict any one customer, it is likely that they've been coming for less than 10 years. But the people you may really want to understand and want to be able to interact with might be the ones who've been coming for more than 20. And we're starting to see a hint of that here. This is one of those variables that we would expect is going to be positively correlated with customer lifetime value. If you've been attending over time and you have to buy a ticket to attend, then your customer lifetime value should be going up with years attended. This would also give us potentially, when we get to predictive modeling later, this could also give us a, uh, a good way of estimating the likelihood of future revenue. So if a customer is only at this stage right now, but there's a percentage chance that they're going to go on and stay for 20 years, then we could do the present discounted value of that future stream of income of ticket sales to that customer with this data. So this is ordinal data, a visualization. It doesn't make sense to do a five number summary. Some people do it 
Um, there's a couple gray areas in statistics, and they all come down to which side of that categorical and continuous uh, variable type you decide you're on. Um, you really shouldn't be doing five number summaries for something like this. It doesn't quite make sense because if you do get a category, then if this turns out to be the median or this turns out to be the median, it's six to nine years. It's just a category. It's not a hard median. Some people then say, well, we'll take the average of what's ever in that category. Um, that's, an, that's an estimate at best. Now, that's very different than interval data. When you cross into continuous data, of which interval is the lowest form, now visualizations and tables are all possible. So if we look here on the right, this is the five number summary, which is actually six numbers, because it gives both the median and the mean. You could have chose which one or the other you wanted. The minimum value is zero. That makes sense. On the survey, they couldn't select anything less than zero. That was one of the options. The max is 10. That's consistent. We see that the overwhelming majority of individual festival customers marked a 10. They're extremely likely to recommend. Followed, you know, nine is a large group, and then it quickly goes down to small levels. The first quartile is at 9. The second quartile is at 10 because 50% of the data is right in here. And this is not the result of outliers. I'll show you some other data that has outliers that result in arbitrarily high means versus medians and things like that. But this is, people are very, very engaged with this festival. They love going to it. They recommend it to people. That's a consistent piece of the feedback that we've got throughout the, uh, the analysis that's been done here. So we can look at this and say, all right, we think that the average central tendency is it's high. It's between 9 and 10. And if you know about this type of question, likelihood to recommend, it comes from this HBR paper, the one number you need to grow. I don't believe that this is the only number you need to grow, but net promoter score is a good indicator of word of mouth promotion, which is one of the main forms of marketing still. But going from likelihood to recommend that's been scaled from zero to 10, and now transforming it into three categorical groups, detractors, passives, and promoters, and here's how that's done. Anyone who's a zero to six becomes a detractor the assumption here is that they are out there actively talking against the festival. So anyone from this, this group of 68 people, 51 people, 17, 9, 14, 5, 5, this group of whatever, 200, 200 people are out there just actively telling people, oh, don't go to that festival. Wasn't worth it. You shouldn't do it. They're detracting from your growth. Sevens and eights are passives, and nines and tens are promoters. And this is, most people think that you should just kind of add five and below, do detractors. There was strong evidence that this actually goes higher. And within this festival data, there was additional analysis that was done using uh, natural language processing to look at open-ended responses, unstructured nominal data, by these groups to see who was, who was, um, how their sentiment actually broke out. And it does seem that these people were more positive than these, these people were more positive than these. But overall, everybody on the whole was pretty positive. But you can take something like a continuous variable and you can dumb it down into categorical data. That's what we've done here. So what is their net promoter score then? Because now we're back to ordinal data, right? Detractors are lower than passives. Passives are lower than promoters. Almost everyone is a promoter. In fact, if you take this percentage, and this is how you calculate net promoter score, what is this percentage? You just ignore passives, minus this percentage, and what you get is the net group of people who are out there talking positively about your organization. Word of mouth, and how does then that affect customer lifetime value? Their net promoter score is extremely high at 75%. Um, we could use these three groups for additional analysis. Now that they're categorical, they'd be great to break apart. Like, what is the cust average customer lifetime value of promoters versus passives versus detractors? We'd assume that this is much higher than either of these two groups. And that's something we could do additionally 
with some additional analytics. Okay, what about number of tickets purchased per visit? This is ratio data. Tickets, you can buy no ticket, it has a hard zero. That makes sense. And the minimum you see there is zero. The max is 400, and this is ticket purchases per visit. So somebody who's coming and buying 400 tickets might be an outlier. And so what we're going to do for two reasons. One, uh, we can actually define outliers as anybody who's more than three standard deviations above the mean or 1.5 times the interquartile range. We can define those as, as outliers and drop them and rerun this analysis. But if you choose to do that, there's nothing wrong with dropping outliers. In some cases, you have to. I'll show you an example in a moment. There's no choice. You have to. But the presence of outliers can also hide visually some important patterns. Like right here, it just kind of looks as though there's this big, big percentage of uh, people who are buying low-level tickets, and it kind of just dwindles off. And there's like, well, maybe there's a spike here. Don't really understand why. When we drop anyone who is over 13 tickets, which is how we define outliers, this is the pattern we suddenly see. And it's not that this pattern wasn't there before. It's that in this visual, because you got a value at 400, 300, 200, and some of these are consistent, are real observations. This one we suspect was someone who probably meant to say 40 and accidentally typed 400 on a survey, and it's survey data, so that's one of the issues. But there were also people who we could tell do buy large ticket purchases all at once, and it's because they were parts of organizations, they weren't just single individuals. So it's not as though that pattern isn't there, it's just not easy to see, because when you drop the outliers and just visualize what is by far the majority of ticket purchases, what you see is extreme multimodality. This isn't like the, we've been coming for 20 years. This is a clear indication that people do not come on their own. All of these spikes happen at even number ticket purchases. So part of what they have to understand about their customers is their customer lifetime value is being in part determined by other people attending with them. Okay, so we took ratio data, we trimmed off the outlier, look at what happens with the mean, it gets close to the median. We would now have more confidence to say that probably the average number of ticket purchases is right around here four. But look, most people, the mode, are going to purchase two. Some people are going to purchase six, eight, ten, there's a spike again at twelve. But the average then, the median, is in this four range. What about the customer lifetime value itself, that metric? Again, just like the last variable, because you have outliers, it gets hard to see this visually. Now, this max value, this is one of the reasons you run a five-number summary, we have a max value of 478, 479,878 as a customer lifetime value. Now, if the average is really 1,500, which this is skewing incredibly, that is so far different that we need to be concerned. Anything that is more than, in the notes right here, more than three standard deviations above the mean is considered an outlier. This is 55 standard deviations above the mean. Initially, we thought this is probably not a correct value. Somebody entered this wrong, but this is observational data. This isn't survey data. This is from a computer system. So then we went to IT and said, you need to pull all this data again and we want to see this record. All the ticket purchases were there. There was an open-ended question, an unstructured question at the end of the survey. And in that unstructured question, they mentioned that they were part of this large organization that brings people to this festival. So they really do buy $500,000 worth of tickets in their lifetime. They're not common at all. And we can't continue with the analysis to get an accurate measure of center with them in there. So... We trimmed off those outliers. That's anybody that was above $2,624. You see that the mean falls significantly. It's a third of what it was before. Um, it even adjusted the median, which is pretty incredible. There's quite a few of those upper, um, those upper outliers. But now we start to see something that's a little bit more predictable. And if we had to say, what is our central tendency? It seems like the average customer lifetime value is somewhere between $250 to $500, and this mean is probably an okay assessment of it.
to ratio data. It's also bound on one side. Whenever you have a variable that's bound on one side, like ratio data, you will have this kind of right skew. Now, something else very interesting happens in this data, and it happens in almost all data that I've ever looked at. Uh, it keeps me up at night. Per the spirit of Pareto haunts me because everywhere we look, we, we love, at Imperitas, there's just like a running joke that any data set we get that we're going to run this analysis. We're going to look for the Pareto distribution. This shows on the this is ratio data, still the customer lifetime value metric, but now we've done something. We've looked at the percentage of individuals. We've converted the individuals into, a, into percentages and then looked at the percentage of total customer lifetime value. And this pattern shows up all the time. 20%, this line right here shows you 20% of the individuals, customers, are bringing in 80% of the customer lifetime value. This shows up in nonprofit data. This shows up in marketing data. In fact, it's called the 80-20 rule in marketing. Uh, we've done a huge uh, meta-analysis of AdWords data. 80% of AdWord clicks come from 20% of AdWord campaigns. And it was an economist, Pareto, who discovered this by looking at pea pods. So he would go in and he'd go in the garden and he'd grow peas and then he'd open the pods and he'd count the number of peas in them. And he noticed that 20% of the peas were producing 80% of the pods. So people started studying ant colonies, and they found out that 20% of ants do 80% of the work. And the danger here is that you can't just ignore. You can't say, great, I'm going to just do these 20% of customers and ignore everybody else. If you do that, and they tried this with the ant colonies, what happens is this 20% will subdivide again. You'll just find more precision. They'll subdivide into 80% uh, of the value within this 20% is going to be coming from 20% of the 20%. So you can't ignore all your other customers, but the point is, this group, who by the way are the ones who seem to be coming for 20 years, through another analysis we found out, have a different level of value than everybody else. This, this shows up so much in data that if you have data that it's not there in, I will consider cutting off my left pinky over it. It's, it's that predictable. It shows up all the time. And it's pretty easy to calculate. You just need to look at the percentage of the total of something, by the percentage of the individuals, and you will see this same kind of logarithmic pattern. Okay, so we looked at an ordinal, we looked at a normal, we well, looked at the data set, figured out its, uh, its origin story, its levels of measurement, that it was cross-sectional, that it was a sample. We looked at the fact that we had some observational, some survey data, we then went in and identified, we had some, a nominal identifier we didn't want to look at. We looked at an ordinal variable about attendance. We looked at ticket sales and customer lifetime value. And in the end, what have we learned so far from digging through this? What's the interpretation that we can walk away with from just a few simple metrics that all we did was calculate measures of shape, center, and spread? So here's what we learned. Most of these festival customers have been attending for less than 10 years. But there's a small group that's been coming for more than 20. Festival customers are unlikely to come alone. They'll buy four tickets on average, and virtually all are likely to recommend the festival. The average customer lifetime value is $486, but 80% of all customer lifetime value is coming from just 20% of festival customers. Okay, this is quite a lot of information that we've learned in a short amount of time from only a handful of variables. And it doesn't, this is the first step towards additional modeling. And this is where next month's lecture, as we're coming to an end now, I'll put in the plug for the one that's going to post for next month. You can use the same registration page in paratos.com forward slash lecture. Just give us a day to get the new one up after today. But the next step would be multivariate an analytics. Okay, let's go look at the test of difference and measures of association. Let's see if we can understand why some people come have been coming for more than 20 years and how they differ. Let's go look at that Pareto segment whose customer lifetime value is just so much higher than everybody else. Let's actually look at ticket purchases and see it. Yes, four is the average, but two is the most predictable. So any plans that we want to make as an organization about how to increase revenue, how to increase profit, should be guided by customer lifetime value and how each of these components feed into that. 
And once we would get through with tests of difference and measures of association, we can look at things like present discounted value, future ticket sales, and then we can put this into a predictive model and say, what is it that predictively leads to higher customer lifetime value? And then we can get hard numbers for each piece. Well, if they buy this much more in a ticket, it's this likelihood that they're moving into a higher CLV group beyond just the ticket price. It means they're more likely to keep coming. It means they're more likely to recommend uh, what's the present discounted value of all that future income and the number of people that they bring with them. All of that stuff can be put into a predictive model that can be trained on this data set. We would hold out 20% of the data so we wouldn't, the model wouldn't be able to look at it. And then with the other 80%, knowing all these individual variables that we've looked at, we could build a predictive model and then test it against the 20% holdout. Did it predict their customer lifetime value accurately? Was it too high? Was it too low? Once we have that model, you could feed something like this survey. It could just run in the background of your festival every year. And as people fill it out, it could categor automatically categorize them into which kind of customer segment they are, what kind of persona they are, and then tell you their, their value that can change your cost of acquisition strategies. You should be marketing, you should be spending far more money to market to that 20% customer, the one in five, who's bringing in 80% of the revenue. That's a different kind of customer and you can talk to them differently, you could market to them differently. There's actually a lot of data in this survey about marketing that wasn't included, about what channels they pay attention to, uh, unaided, partially aided, fully aided recall, things we've talked about in some of the other lectures. That model then gives you the ability to start to make really rational, value-based decisions around customer acquisition, customer retention, uh, recommendation plans and strategies. And all that data is there. We just need to start with that foundation of what is its origin? What is its totality? What is its scope? What is its measurement? And then looking at it through the lens of shape, center, and spread, both visually and in table form. We'll post these slides. We'll post this recording like we have to our YouTube page. We will send it out by email as well uh, in the coming days so that you can watch this over. I know that this is a lot to go through. I can't even believe that we've done it in an hour and, and just a little change. Um, next lecture, as these continue to build on each other, next month what we will do probably with this same data set is start to talk about how to turn analytics into actual insights. What are the tests of differences that we can do? What are the measures of association that we can find? What is a predictive model that we can build? And then how do we use that predictive model as an organization to go actually to go back out and get customers with higher value? If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Throw them up in the chat. I'll hang around here for a minute. Thank you again for joining us today. We'll see you at the next one on Thursday, October 19th. It's one month from today. Turning analytics into actual insights. Again, imperitas.com forward slash lecture. Should you want a copy of this data set, email me, Luciano, L-U-C-I-A-N-O, at imperitas.com.